I thought I would do a condensed version of the workshop we just had where we went through training and a little bit of the context as to what to expect. So this, uh, this sequence here, uh, it'll probably still be long, probably about an hour, but not 2.5 hours like we went yesterday. So I wanted to start off by uh, highlighting the most important point, and that is that our goal is to inspire. If we've done that, we've succeeded. And the reason I mention this is that the workshop jumps you know, with both feet into algorithmic thinking. There is the question of teaching uh, actual computation in the afternoons. And we can pretty quickly become focused on the technical uh, deliverables or assessment. But I wanted to start off by saying our biggest goal is to inspire these young women. And the reason for that is that they live in a very different environment to the one we live in. Uh, we are, you know, without a doubt, the top 5%. Uh, even mainstream America does not have the vision, the understanding of what it is to live in this environment, what those career opportunities are, what that life trajectory is. And so for many of these young women, especially the ones that come from below the poverty level, this is completely outside the scope of their reality. And so getting a glimpse into that, <clears throat> hearing from hearing from you, it's an opportunity that they would not have in their lives. So I wanted to start off by that and be very clear that that is our goal. Can they see a different possibility? Can they understand what that dream is? So when they sit down in that moment of quiet and they have that moment of reflection, they can dream. If they don't know that this is possible, it is not possible to dream. So this is our overarching goal. I mentioned here simply, you know, our awareness, keen awareness of, of career path. Uh, a lot of kids in the U.S., certainly the MIT bound, um, are keenly aware of much of this. Uh, for most uh, women growing up in Mexico, if they think of university, and this is, you know, I imagine, uh, as I mentioned before, due through socioeconomic um, where you're born into, that has an impact. But if you do think of it, it is much like thinking about going to your local high school. When that time comes, you will simply go to the local college. And the same thing is true about traditional roles and being an engineer and a scientist and the challenges that come with choosing those careers. Uh, there are still a minority in a much smaller and much smaller numbers than in the U.S. Uh, if you've not heard me say this, it is below 10% in the largest uh, school system. So with that in mind, uh, the other thing that I'd like to emphasize as well is that we use the wrong language. We tend to speak, and I do it a lot. I know I'm very conscious of it. So last year as I went into the workshop, I used a completely different approach. Uh, I did mostly storytelling. Uh, I tried to make engaging activities. Uh, and we'll come back to more on that. But just watch the language that you use. It's not about you know emphasizing uh, order of growth, or is not about you know orders of magnitude. It is not about certain mathematical constructs or engineering constructs that we often use in our language. It is more about communicating powerful ideas. And it's not about watering down the ideas. It's simply making them accessible with different language. If you understand it deeply, you can understand it simply. So I'll, I'll stop at that on that. Uh, this uh, this slide here refers to that. Uh, you know, to sort of turn the lens on the U.S. and criticize what we do here is uh, high school education uh, when it comes to computer science and programs that exist around cities are still targeting the 5%. I had a meeting this earlier this week with a group and one of the young women uh, came up to me afterwards and said, I'm so excited. Uh, I'm already taking, you know, AP computer science in high school. And then I asked her, you know, how many other women are with you in the class? And she said three. And when I asked her how many women are in your high school, she said over a thousand. And so even if it was all women in that class, you're still talking at a very small percentage of women. And so we are not making these ideas accessible even here within the U.S. You can imagine what that's like in the developing world. So this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, the other thing is, in the U.S. and in many places, this is often a question of identity. If you go and take a computer science class, you are somehow making a choice. This is not true if you take a history class or if you take an English class. But when it comes to 
uh, making that choice, it is a choice that you have to make. In the developing world, in a way, this is an easier one because no one has told them this is not for them. This is not something or something that only a select few choose. Uh, and connected to that, I'll tell you a brief story about how the name Beautiful Patterns came to be. I started out with a very different description, something for the workshop that have worked at MIT. Uh, in many ways, the course in Mexico was modeled or derived from ideas that I have in my own course at MIT. And I sent the description through, thinking, OK, I understand what's successful. I understand what people connect to or what students connect to. Uh, and that went out. About a month later, the organizers came back, and they told me not a single girl has signed up for the workshop, but there's a lot of boys that want to take it. And so they you know, asked me to make it co-ed, and I asked to be given another chance, which turned out to be several more chances. But ultimately, we ended up in the description that you see on the site. It is talking about patterns. Ultimately, even within computer science, we have that strong tradition of design patterns. And it is presenting the same ideas, just doing it in a different way. And in fact, that description was so successful that parents, without me, my name being mentioned in Mexico, you know, figured out who I was, tracked me down through <laughs> information on websites, and were calling me, emailing me, trying to get their daughters into the program because it sold out. Uh, so anyway, it, I mentioned this simply to emphasize that there is a very successful way to present these ideas without getting them uh, to turn off. Say. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is that creating a course, for those of you who have not created before, requires a lot of different skills. And in, in many ways, you are leading you're bringing the TAs along with you, you're setting a tone, and in general this is something that requires quite a bit. And if you want to see the full extent of it, you can see the actual workshop, right? There's tons of people, there's tra traveling, there's planning, and there is the actual content. Uh, you will have mini uh, um, a mini version of this in the classroom, but still think of it as a big endeavor, a lot of things that need to happen. You are the leader, people will be looking to you. And so this is simply just uh, making the case. Now, the slides that follow have to do more with delivery and what I think works uh, in the classroom. And let me start off by showing you this picture. This is a picture of Walter Lewin, without a doubt, one of the best lecturers that MIT ever had. Uh, and his passion was just infectious, contagious, right? Uh, the point here is if you don't care about the material you're delivering, you have no chance of getting your students to be excited. If you do, there is a chance. Uh, and there are amazing ideas in this field, right? The constructs, the uh, techniques, you know, the, the, the concepts are incredibly powerful. You know, they are stay awake type of <laughs> exciting. Uh, communicating some of that is, again, going back what will make this successful. So certainly convey those ideas that really connect with you. Try to emphasize those. Try to connect. Um, that's more of the same. The other point is tell a lot of stories. We are wired for stories. You know, through human history, this is how knowledge has been transferred. Uh, you ever have the chance to see a really good storyteller? Just watch the audience. They're captured, connected to him or her. Uh, and the other thing is we can remember these very well. Uh, you know, and it's often said it's your brain's natural save button. Uh, and this is something that I try to use often. So think about introducing the ideas with short little stories. And when I say short little stories, um, under five minutes. There are still stories that I remember, say, from my calculus book in high school that had little nuggets about how Newton or you know some of the other early uh, pioneers in this space uh, came up with an idea. And I still remember them today, and they're still very fun and you know sort of um, made the idea or the concept uh, or the technique on the page come to life. Uh, to simply illustrate the point, I gave the story of Kill a Girl Hours, and for those of you who don't know it, uh, during the war there was a job that uh, would be advertised in the, uh, in the newspaper for computers. Uh, computers were humans, so <laughs> if you look for an article when computers used to be human, you'll get to hear about some of these ideas. And as you can see here, the majority of them were women. In fact, there were so many women in the field, and as you might imagine, they did a lot of the tasks that were required in the in the war, like firing tables and many things like this, um, and were performed by women. And there were so many women, as I said, that the level of effort was measure, measured in kilogirl hours. So again, trying to illustrate 
this uh, access to these ideas and how something like this might be very memorable. Not many people know that the position there was a position called computer that was a human and much less people know that it was women that were performing it and that effort, much like computational effort is measured today, was measured in terms of kilogirl hours. So this, this is simply an, ex uh, an example of a story. Uh, let me go on to uh, close here and share with you a little bit of what we understand and some of the data that we know. Uh, Guy Kawasaki, famous uh, venture capitalist for Silicon Valley, said 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 font. I would uh, ask you here to half it with the girls, go five slides, 10 minutes most. Uh, you can leave the font alone. Uh, the other piece of data comes from edX. You really shouldn't go more than six minutes. Uh, you should speak faster rather than slower. Uh, average speed rate uh, for speaking is 150 words per minute. If you are closer to 180, that's better. If you're below that, uh, it doesn't really work. People sort of tune off or fast forward if they can what you're saying. Uh, also they prefer diagrams by substantial margin to PowerPoint and that is because they get to accompany you as you are creating it and they get to participate and there is a chance for them to um, digest that in a slower way. Uh, the other thing as well is images have higher recall and here by the way I'll stop and I'll say that I had no slides during my entire week and everything I did in the workshop was simply uh, drawing on the board and telling these short little stories and then moving on to activities and we'll come back to that as we move into the content. Uh, the other thing as well is there will be many of you that will be sharing techniques. Uh, it is important to understand that often what works for one person does not work for another. We all have our own personal style and ultimately you will, if you do not already know what it is, you will hopefully find that that quickly. Uh, but this is simply a note that, you know, if somebody else is having great success with something and it's not working for you, that is quite common. So some closing thoughts. I talked about passion. I talked about the importance of stories. Uh, I talked about uh, pictures and some of the data. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and wrap up here uh, and let's move on to the actual content of the workshop.